Philippians chapter 4, a review to renew. These are probably my most favorite messages to deliver is when we get through an entire chapter and then I go through, it's usually about five to eight messages that cover one chapter. And I'm literally spanning all my notes and trying to pull out the main themes from each of those previous messages. And then I compile what I call the review to renew. Why? Because I believe we are such a fast paced people. We like to get to the next message. We like to get to the next chapter. We like to get to the next book. And meanwhile, we forget completely what we covered in the previous messaging or the previous chapter. And I say, slow down. So I did my best to compile Philippians 4 in one message. But before I do that, and you may be joining us for the first time tonight, thank you, God bless you, welcome you. You may have joined in the middle of our series, Joy in the Journey. So I'm going to do my best to sum up the entire book of Philippians chapter by chapter before I even get into our review of chapter four. What you can do is go into your app and you'll have all the notes that will pop up on the screen, but you can also stay in the word in Philippians chapter four, because I'm going to read every single verse, starting with verse one, all the way through verse 23 to cover our review to renew. But here we go. Chapter one, if you were going to read chapter one in the book of Philippians, you would learn that Paul was conveying this very point, literally combined all the verses in chapter one. He wanted them to understand the message of the cross. God will complete what he started in you. How could he do that? The cross. Hey, for me to live is Christ. To die, profitable gain. How's that possible? The cross. Oh yeah, by the way, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let your conduct weigh as much as the cross. Chapter one is about the message of the cross. We enter chapter two, Paul is conveying the image of Christ. Because you'll never have the image of Christ if you don't go through the message of the cross. What do you mean the image of Christ? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What type of mind was that? That was the mind of God. That was the character of God shown out in flesh form in Christ. That's the image of Christ that is supposed to be in us. It's character. Then we enter chapter three and Paul is conveying eventually, hey, don't look around at the world. Don't look around at the filth and get caught up in the nonsense and the chaos and the confusion. You are a citizen of heaven. And he builds his case to convey through chapter three, the passage of citizenship. When you understand where you're from and that's the passage you take, let me tell you something. You will not respond to the nonsense in the temporal because you understand the economy of what is eternal. Here's my problem. I personally get caught up in the peripheral. And when I get caught up in the peripheral, I completely lose sight of the eternal. So I go through the cross, the message of the cross, I begin to birth the image of Christ because I remember where I'm from. That's the passage of citizenship. And then finally in chapter four, he conveys the advantage of contentment. There's an advantage when you understand contentment. What is contentment? In one word, hope. Understanding Jesus is your living hope. We just sang it. Your perspective changes when you understand that Jesus is your living hope. Hope, when you give someone hope, you give them a future. Probably to boil down the cause behind suicide, it was usually because somebody lost their hope. So conversely, the opposite of hope is hopelessness. And a lot of times I look at my circumstances and believe that because of my circumstances, I'm hopeless. But let me correct you, because hopelessness is not a set of circumstances. Hopelessness is failing to set your heart on Jesus. Remember, Paul's the example following the primary example, Jesus, writing this letter to the Philippians from prison. But not once does he lose his hope. So if it was based on his circumstances, he should have been hopeless. But because he had hope in Christ, hope became for Paul a present power. Hope is sometimes defined as something that is future oriented, the absolute coming of something that's going to be good for me, biblically speaking. But hope also has a present power to it. Here's a verse for you, Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope 
fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may overflow with hope. Imagine in any circumstance, any situation, you set your mind on Jesus, there is a hope that rises up within you and then hope becomes a present power. Hope is also a perspective shifter. Hope gets you to see beyond a confining circumstance. Hope gets to see what is eternal, what is heavenly, instead of getting caught up in what is temporary. Here's the verse, Romans 8, 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do you understand that's hope? Oh, the sufferings of this present time? Well, you don't know how bad I have it. No, did you hear the verse? The sufferings of this present time cannot be compared with the glory. In other words, that hope will shift your perspective. And finally, hope is a soul purifier. 1 John chapter 3, and everyone who has this hope in him, this hope in Christ and this hope that looks towards him returning purifies himself just as he is pure. In other words, catch this. I become like that which I behold. And if my life is looking forward to behold the pure one, Jesus, then there's a purifying effect in my soul. So not only is hope a present power, hope is a perspective shifter, hope is a soul purifier. Now let's get in to Philippians chapter four, verses one, reading. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, stand fast in the Lord beloved. We stop, we pause, because in this series of scriptures, you will discover the Apostle Paul will write in the Lord three different times. The first time he mentions in the Lord, it's stand fast. Stand fast is a military term, which means hold your ground, soldier. Don't let the enemy push you back. But hey, you don't have to be so preoccupied with moving forward. Hold your ground. And then we have a parallel behind the believer standing fast. And then the backslider drifting slow. Because there's no such thing as a neutral position as a Christian. We're either holding our ground, we are standing fast in the Lord, or we are, get this, sitting slow to the temptations of the world. You're either standing fast in the salvation of the Lord, or you're sitting slow to the temptations of the world. Mercy Me has a song that talks about it's a slow fade. You don't even realize it. See, we're either building off our faith foundation, or I'm telling you from personal experience, we are fading. We are sitting slow. The word, compromising. Are we holding the ground of our conviction, or are we being pushed back by the enemy's persuasion? Oh, he is subtle. He does not walk around with a pitchfork and a red suit. Oh, he comes to us through Netflix. Sit slow, young one. Watch the series all the way through. A little off color there, a little obscenity there. And all the while, the conviction begins to numb. And that can be translated in a million other examples. But the point is we need to stand fast in the salvation of the Lord. Well, can I give a better definition for what the grounding of our conviction is, what our foundation should be? He says it in the next few verses. You ready for this? I implore Eudia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. There's the ground of your conviction. You want a foundation for your faith? What is it? Have the same mind as Jesus. If you have the same mind as Jesus, oh, things change in how you view them. Now, as Paul's writing, remember, he's addressing a conflict in the church. First, he says, stand fast on your conviction. 
What's our conviction, Paul? Have the same mind as Jesus. I know there's a dispute amongst you. I'm not taking sides. I'm actually calling both parties and the rest of the church body to be of the same mind in the Lord. You can't argue with that. You can't present a better case when the Bible beckons you to have the same mind as the Lord. The same mind as the Lord? Yeah. The same mind as the Lord is that your faith work would always be outlined by redemption's framework. What? Yeah, my faith work, how I work out my faith should always have an outline of redemption's framework. In other words, if you think you're in your faith and you're at beef with someone, then you are out of that framework because the mind of the Lord is always about redemption, reconciliation, and restoration. He never goes outside of that. His chief aim is to bring restoration, reconciliation, and redemption. I want that mind. I don't have that mind. I wake up with my own mind. So I need to get into the word and cast my own natural stinking thinking away and begin to renew my mind and transform my life so that I could have the chief aim be restoration. Here's the problem. Paul's saying, this mind that I'm asking you to have in the Lord, that's your conviction. Come to terms in that dispute because your names are written in the book of life. What was he doing? He was elevating their perspective. He was saying, you can't possibly have a conflict with someone on earth when you remember your name is written in heaven. So then he calls the whole church to assist in this and he would write, rejoice in the Lord always, verse 4. Again, I will say rejoice. Why is that connected with the call to have restoration? Because you can never have joy in the Lord if you have beef with man. Can't. There's a reason. He said, hey, I know I'm asking all the parties involved to come to the same mind in the Lord and rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness let your forbearance, let your equity, let your mercy be known to all men. And here's why this is crucial. Because if I don't deal with conflict in my life, there's always going to be a residual that follows me from conflict. It's the residual of bitterness. It's the residual of resentfulness. It is the residual of unforgiveness. Oh, it loves to take root in the heart. When I think I'm justified, well, they wronged me. You don't know what they did to me. And all the while, the enemy is saying, yes, build your case. And as you build your heavy case against them, I'm going to allow bitterness to root within you. But Paul's saying, you want joy in the Lord? It's a choice to rejoice. Here's what Hebrews would actually say about that. You're saying, well, I tried to have peace with this person that I'm in conflict with. And I go, that's great, because that's what Hebrews says. Chapter 12, beginning in verse 14. Pursue peace with all people. Okay, I want to do that. And holiness, there's a standard, without which no one will see the Lord. Look carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. That's check yourself before you wreck yourself. Check yourself so you don't frustrate God's grace. That's what that means. A lot of people take this out of context. They see you could fall short of God's grace. No, it's saying you are taking advantage in a negative way of God's grace. And he's saying don't do that because when you abuse God's grace, any root of bitterness springing up can cause trouble and by this many become defiled. How do you get there? Let me summarize. Ignorance of God's goodness is the cause of all bitterness. How can I say that? Because people would 
bring an argument back that, no, 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 this person did this to me. I'm offended. This person has this, and they, they took this from me. So I deserve to be resentful toward them and bitter toward them. I go, no, you're missing it because Jesus had every right, and he deserved to be bitter towards how they treated him. He was the only innocent one. But here's the difference. He understood that his father's plan was perfect. And I'm saying that bitterness then is birthed because I don't understand God's goodness. When I understand God's goodness, there's no root of bitterness that can rise up in me. Paul would then write about, be anxious for nothing. Because I can imagine the letter being read and those who are currently at odds with one another, and then on top of that, there was external persecution coming at these believers. There was a lot to deal with in that day for these individuals. You would stop and say, Paul, are you out of your mind? Do you see what's going on in the midst of us? Do you see what's going on around us? And he would write, yeah, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Your actual felt needs, that's the word request, with a heart of thanksgiving, because anything less than thanksgiving is a complaint. And a lot of times my prayer comes out as a complaint, and I don't even realize it. Why is this happening, God? And all the while, anxiety, which is defined as worry, which is defined as strangulation. When I worry, it strangles out my thought pattern. It strangles out my vision. It strangles out my peace. But if you catch what the apostle is putting down, he's saying, give God your anxiety and God will give you his tranquility. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. I love that because it's saying nothing in this world can produce this type of peace doesn't come by a man's contriving. It only comes by way of God's giving. It's a deposit into the heart and mind of the believer who says, God, take this. I can't handle it. And we release it. And when it comes back on me and I feel it, I cast it back to the Lord. Cast your, your cares upon the Lord because he cares. And the peace of God stands at guard at the heart and mind that's a militant word, guard. There's nothing fluffy about God's peace. It's a fortress, not a feeling. So we open up our hearts and minds to this peace because peace cannot be the rhythm of your heart when worry is the pace of your mind. Anybody have their mind just pacing, worrying? How's this going to play out? How's this going to turn out? And then we worry, and often amongst the family, when we begin to complain out of our worry, hey, it's not an indictment against your circumstances. That's an indictment against God, your father, because you're saying he's not good enough to take care of you. So I say, at least for me in my home, I won't allow another believer to badmouth my father because it's at his expense that we do it. Because I'm going to let you talk bad about my earthly father. No, you don't know him. If you knew him, you wouldn't say that. A lot of people complain. I know that's our native tongue to complain. It's natural. But the word of God asks us to put down that natural self so that the spiritual new man and woman can rise up in a new language of praise with thanksgiving, letting the requests of your heart be made known to a God who cares for you. So here's the question. What's the remedy to combat worry? It's to remember that nothing is too large for God's omnipotence and nothing is too small for God's attentiveness. There's nothing too large that God's Sovereignty, his power, his provision can't handle. And there's not even anything in your world that's too small that he doesn't care about. Jesus said it. Hey, 
You know the sparrows? You can purchase two for a copper coin. And by the way, you get five for two copper coins. They were that cheap. Not a single one of those sparrows can fall to the ground apart from the Father's will. Does that not rock your world? That not a sparrow that we would step over on the sidewalk if it was down and dead. The father says, I saw it, I ordained it, I allowed it. Nothing can fall apart from my will. And if he cares that much about a sparrow and the hairs on your head are numbered, oh, he's got a plan. So I pray, give me your eyes to see how you see. Nothing's too small for his attentiveness. Oh, and nothing's too large for his omnipotence. Exodus chapter 14, the Israelites are literally, they're relieved from their duties as the Egyptian slaves and they get out and they come to a a, a sea and they come to a rock wall and they turn and the Egyptians are pursuing. Oh, that's a pretty big problem. And God says, Moses, stand still. Stand fast, and you will see the salvation of the Lord. I will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Why are you worried about that? I know it looks large. I know it looks big, but I'll fight the battle. You just hold your peace. Don't allow worry to overwhelm you. You hold your peace. It happened in the same way over and over again with the nation of Israel. It happened with King Jehoshaphat. There was armies surrounding him. He prayed to the Lord and the Lord said the same thing. Stand still and hold your peace. I'll fight your battle. And here's what happened. The armies turned on each other and they all took each other out. How is this? This comes in rhyme form. That a sparrow doesn't fall from the sky, nor does an arrow in war fly, apart from passing through the Father's attentive and protective eye. Nothing's too small. Nothing's too large. So here's the follow-up question. So how do I, it sounded cute, how do I uproot bitterness from my heart because I'm struggling with certain people? And how do I cast away anxiousness because I'm worrying about so many things? The answer is simple. It comes by embracing the word of God. That's it. That's all I got. If you're not in the word of God, if you're not embracing the word of God, this was not going to help you tonight. You have to spend time in the word of God. That's why in verse eight, he says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. In other words, he's saying, yeah, got to get into the word. And the word and the purpose of getting into the word is not just to learn more. The purpose of getting into the word is to make you more mature. It's to make your mind more secure. What I just read, they're biblical filters. They're literally biblical filters. When you run what you're reading currently through these filters, what you're watching currently through these filters, at the end of that filter, what comes out on the other side? Is it true? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it noble? Is it virtuous? Can it be praiseworthy? There are biblical filters to censor against sin. Because if the world we live in has a censor against the sun, Jesus' name is censored, then why doesn't the believer have a censor against sin? Because that's the greatest shame against that name. The indictment upon myself is that I used to find sin funny. I used to laugh at the things that God died for when I was ripping and running and living a godless life, an immoral life. And we'd have a good time reminiscing about those particular happenings in our past. And God says, you find that funny? Have you ran that story, that humor through my word? The biblical filter 
The things we're to think upon, the things we're to focus on, and the things we're to fill up on. Here's why. Because your thought life is an invisible power that eventually becomes visible in your behavior. You know, what you think upon will eventually be what you act upon. The thoughts, they determine the feelings, the feelings, the emotions, the emotions, eventually the actions, and then a formation of the character. So I need to spend time washing my mind in the water of the word because my mind is so corrupt on its own. Paul would then move into verse 10, and he would say to the church in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. You lacked opportunity, he writes, because they were trying to find the Apostle Paul. He was moving quick on his missionary journeys. He was propagating the gospel, and they couldn't find him. And he says, hey, I heard you were looking for me, so I appreciate that you cared, and I know it wasn't because you lacked opportunity. I'm grateful for you finally catching up to me. I feel the gift that you've given me. He uses a word that says flourished. It means springtime weather in wintertime conditions. And and I've reduced that to say, wow, whether it was a financial gift, and it was, but more so, it was the compassion they showed him that warmed him. See, to be moved with compassion is always followed by action. When you're moved with compassion, you know, when you're driving and you see somebody on the sidewalk that's in need, they have a sign and they're asking for, and you're moved with compassion, and you go, man, I feel so bad for him. And then off I take. Oh, no, that wasn't compassion. That was more like sympathy. Like, I feel bad for you. Compassion is always followed by action. Compassion can be defined as your pain in my heart. And here's the reality. Compassion is often only birthed through brokenness. The reason you could feel other people's pain is because you felt your own pain. And the reason you can offer them hope is because you felt the healing from the hope giver. Paul would continue. The thread gets interesting. He uses rejoice in the Lord because of what you gave me. I find that amazing because he's going to correct what we think. That see, Paul was basing his joy on what he got from them as a gift. And I say joy in the Lord was not based on circumstances being favorable or a care package being deliverable. Joy in the Lord was based on God's grace being reliable. That's what Paul based his joy in the Lord on, that God's grace is reliable. Translation, verse 11 and 12. Not that I speak in regard to need. By the way, I'm not talking about need. I appreciate the gift, but I'm not talking about the gift. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. Oh, yeah, Paul, what do you know about different states? Oh, I know how to be abased. That means exalted. Oh, I know how to be, to abound, or a base is humiliated. Abound is to be exalted everywhere and in all things. I know what it's like to be full. Hey, I felt the pangs of being hungry, both to have and to suffer need. Interesting. What is contentment then? Contentment is not based on circumstantial achievement or accomplishment. Contentment is based on Christ's sacrificial atonement. You see, if contentment was based on accomplishment or achievement, then those who are considered successful by the world standards and wealthy by those same standards would be the most content people in all of the world. Yet when you peel away the layers of the material, you find out that these people are miserable. There's a craving to satisfy the hole in the soul. So I want more. And when I get the more that I wanted, I realize it wasn't enough. And it's a vicious cycle in the pursuit of satisfaction. And a lot of people will settle on, oh, I'm content in my life. I'm like, no, you're not content. You're comfortable. And if you're not comfortable, you're complacent. Oh, contentment isn't based on conditions. Oh, contentment isn't even based on possessions. Contentment is based on a person. His sacrificial atonement paid it all. I owe nothing. God, what do I owe you? Oh, you owe nothing. 
Jesus paid it all. And I remember that. Or go back to the beginning. Hope, present power, perspective shifter, soul purifier. I have joy in the Lord. I have his mind. I don't see how the world sees. Here, contentment is rich. Paul concludes verses 14 to 20 about his appreciation for their gift. And remember, it wasn't about the gift that he received. He was more focused on the fact that they gave it out of a heart of cheerfulness. And he was impressed with that because he was more concerned about their spiritual maturity and development than anything else. So he's writing as like a spiritual father saying, hey, thank you for the gift, but let me tell you something. Parents in here, you might've done this with your children. You were just grateful, not that the fact that they did the chore, but how they did it, the attitude by which they did it. Paul is applauding the state of their heart. So we conclude that the greater value of what they gave wasn't in the gift. The greater value was in the state of how their heart gave. Remember Jesus kind of pulling his disciples to himself. Can you picture this? There was a big fanfare at the temple treasury the who's who's of the day. Oh, they would parade themselves as they dropped off their offerings for all the people to see. And what happened was they're giving so much. And here the commoner walks up and goes, I can't give as much as they. That means I'm not as holy as they. And I leave given from the heart of my heart. I leave feeling like I am not as good as they are. And Jesus goes, come here. See all the Wealth they put in, it's great. See that widow? You could hear the chinging of her gift, which would have caused people to stop and laugh. Two coins, ching, ching, ching. Jesus said, you see what she put in? She put in more than all of them. <laughs> and you got to step back and say, what? Oh, yes. She gave a penny worth eternity because of her heart's sincerity. Paul is applauding the state of their heart upon their gift. In verse 18, he would say, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Calls their gift a sacrifice that was worshipful, to God. I love that because I see it as anything done unto the Lord, whether large or whether small, whether public or whether private, when it's done unto the Lord from a state of heart that is sincere, oh, it's an investment into heaven. You think that God is not watching when you are by yourself worshiping? Oh, that's an investment into heaven. Those that are doing jobs behind the scenes, you think nobody sees that. And when you have a heart that gives it to the Lord, you do anything, whether eating or drinking, you do it unto the Lord. Oh, that's an investment into heaven. That's why it is infinitely better to invest in heaven than to have your only sense of heaven be an earthly investment. There are people who, based on their earthly investments, that's the only sense of heaven they will ever have. Jesus tells a parable. He introduces two characters. One goes by the rich man. His description, fine linen, purple, the color of royalty, and a poor beggar named Lazarus who sat at the rich man's gate and the rich man would step over him day by day. And all Lazarus wanted was the crumbs that would fall from the rich man's plate. And the dogs would lick the sores of this poor beggar named Lazarus. And Jesus continues, one day Lazarus dies and angels usher him into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died and was buried. And then this scene takes on color commentary. The rich man in torment, in Hades. He calls out to Abraham and says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus down with the tip of water on his finger so he can cool my tongue. I am in torment. 
Father Abraham says, oh, when you were on earth, you had your heaven. When he was on earth, he had his hell. Well, can you at least send him back to speak to my brothers? Oh, they have the law and the prophets. Yeah, but my brothers will believe if somebody comes back from the dead. He says, no, they still won't believe if somebody comes back from the dead. He was alluding to himself, the resurrection. What's the point? The point is, Lazarus, the closest he would ever get to hell was his temporary circumstances. And here we look down upon people who don't have, and we say, poor them. And meanwhile, God is doing a work in their heart that is eternal. And one day they'll have eternal pleasure and peace in the presence of God and the rich that we crave and we want what they have, the material, the possessions, and they don't know Jesus. And we say, I want to be like a celebrity. And I'm literally comparing my life to what they have. And all the while, without Jesus, they got nothing. And the closest they'll ever get to heaven is the material world around them. And it's the saddest day when none of that can secure their position in heaven. Verse 19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. Oh, that verse that's the proper biblical definition of the prosperity gospel but don't get it twisted church the prosperity gospel is not that you prosper because of the gospel it's that the gospel prospers inside of you see god is more concerned about your holiness not your happiness god is more concerned about developing you in your maturity spiritually than blessing you beyond your wildest imaginations physically oh that's the prosperity gospel that god wants to do a work in your soul paul would close out this letter it's a benediction we spent two weeks ago a whole sermon was built around these verses that are kind of like just closing verses but i saw it uniquely i said this is amazing. This is the mission statement of the church. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Yeah, that's our banner. God, take the glory. Verse 21, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. That is the church. What do you mean? We greet every saint. We are a community of sinners. We're all on an equal playing field. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. We are a community of sinners that are called to sanctification. Yes, come as you are, but don't you dare leave as you came. That's sanctification. And we are centered on Christ. And here we're seeing a movement in America where the church is moving towards what is called the pop church, popular church. Pop church is not biblical church. What is popular can never be substituted for what is biblical. The trend is real. The pattern can be traced in the pop church you see a complete dethroning of God's word. Oh, you'll see the word of God on the pulpit or the platform, but it's nothing more than a prop. They won't read out of it. They won't read out of it because it'll contradict their message that God's word is no longer a moral authority. It's just something that we go to when it caters to the message I want to convince my audience of. Oh, but God's word is the moral authority. God's word is the only truth. Everything in life must pass through the word of God. So here's what happens. Lip service of truth is contradicted by a disservice to doctrine. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is teaching. From Genesis to Revelation, the doctrine, the old and the new. You don't just forsake the old because we're entered into the new. You see, the old is the new concealed. And the new is the old revealed. Add them up, the old plus the new is Christ revered. The scarlet thread of the cross runs entirely through Genesis to Revelation. God's word is the moral authority. In the pop church, the word of God is being dethroned. And because they dethrone the word of God, there is an inevitable progression negatively of devolving of God's son. What do you mean? Oh, Jesus? He's only used as a point of reference in those churches. He is not a person of reverence. He's just used as an example 
This quote blew me away because it was written such a long time ago. Charles Spurgeon said, if a man can preach one sermon without mentioning Christ's name in it, it ought to be his last. See, the litmus test on whether you should be reading that book, listening to that podcast, attending that church, is if you were to remove the name of Jesus from any of that literature, any of that audio, you remove Jesus and the message does not change at the end, oh, that's a false teaching. Oh, they might sprinkle his name in just a little bit, but if you erased any mentioning of his name and it doesn't change the theme of the book, you take Jesus out of this message I just gave, I got nothing left. I got nothing. With the dethroning of God's word, with the devolving of God's son, there's a defaming of God's holiness. You see, the pop church hangs a banner and says, we love all. Come as you are. But there's never a challenge for people to leave different than, than they came. Come as you are. And then the Christian who's living out of the word, holding a standard of holiness, still loving the world around them, that's who we're supposed to reach, but not compromising a conviction. Oh, that believer is called a hypocrite. They're called a bigot. They're called a hater. And here, the defaming of God's holiness, what is holy should never be compromised under the guise of hospitality. What is holy should never be compromised under the guise of hospitality. See, hospitality has a standard too. Hospitality means lover of strangers, but hospitality can never be compromised with a lack of integrity, with a lack of accountability. And here, the popular church is not the biblical church. The biblical church takes its marching orders from the word of God. And when we honor the word of God, there is an elevation and a worship of the father, son. And when I get close enough to the father, son, there will inevitably be a moral standard of holiness in my life. I want to stay holy. Yes, I'm going to get dirty, but I'm going to come head first back to the cross like David did after he made that major mistake. He says in his scriptures that that man who made those great egregious errors is a man after his own heart. Oh, but if David was alive today and he took another man's wife, and had the man murdered, he'd be on the front page of every paper. He'd be shamed and disgraced, and we would call him what he was. And God says, no, that man's a man after my own heart. And I say, what gives God? He goes, you don't see what I see. See, when he messed up, he owned up. And when he owned up, he came back after my own heart. And that's why he's a man after my heart. So I want to encourage the person here tonight thinks you mess up so bad that God can't receive you. And I'm saying, no, you want to be a person after God's own heart? Just get up and go back after God's heart. And what you will find when you come back after God's heart is a love that is relentless, a love that will never leave you in the same condition it found you, a love that is so overwhelming and so powerful, you cannot possibly leave when you've tasted it the same than when you found it. That's all I got. Because since we're not dead, we are not done. It is my sincere prayer that since we've heard it, we would honestly do it. We'll be back, of course, next Thursday. And then I'm excited to get into 1 John with this assembly. God bless.